If our, all right, let's get let's do this. Uh, if our teams are different recitation times, can we just pick a time that works for everyone? Yeah. So none of you have to follow the recitation times. You can find whatever time works for you. You can form teams across recitations, things like that. Uh, the only the only benefit. Um, if you choose to meet at your recitation time and you're all in the same recitation, you know that room's gonna be available. It's set aside for 312, so even if you don't need it for your team meeting, if you just need a quiet place to study or whatever, uh, you know that room's gonna be available, and if somebody's in there, you can be like, hey, this is for 312, get out. So if, uh, um, if you wanna take advantage of that, that's open for you. But yeah, you can schedule your times, you can meet wherever, however you want. Uh, I'm not gonna be strict about that. In other classes, I'm strict. Uh, like 442 when the project is the course. Uh, in this class where the project is a smaller portion, uh, I, I'm more lenient about it. In this class, I'm really focused on you getting the homeworks done and getting the homeworks. That's where you're really getting a lot of learning. And then the project is where you're getting experience with frameworks, but uh, his last semester is an indication. A lot of y'all don't use frameworks on the project anyway, so uh, you, you kind of bypass some of the learning there. Um, but anyway, I, I don't want to go down that road right now. Uh, but yeah, you can schedule outside of the recitation times. Any other questions before we get going? Toltfish shrugs. Got it. <laughs> did, you, did I miss a question? Oh, yeah, I did. Um, sorry, I thought that was from... Uh, I thought that was from yesterday, I saw it wrong. Uh, note that Buffer has been replaced by the better named memory view in Python 3. You can use either in Python. I don't even know what that's referring to, to be honest. Uh, so when you do your buffering, you'll, you'll create your own buffer. You won't use any internal libraries. All right, anything else? Okay. All right, let's talk about HTML templates. So we have this problem in the homework. We need to serve custom content. But how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we serve custom content in our HTML? The only way we've done this so far is through your API. Your API would serve different JSON strings based on the data that was inserted, uh, modified, or deleted from the database. Uh, but now we have to serve HTML with custom content, it's a new challenge that we have to face. Uh, so how do we do this? So starting from right from objective one in homework two, we have to effectively build a chat feature for our app. We have a form, users can type in messages, and then every user can see everyone else's messages. How are we going to do that? And specifically, once we have the messages, like getting the messages from the form that's parsing the multi-part form request, that's all of last lecture. We talked about that all last lecture. Uh, and that part's in your hands now, trying to parse the multi-part, getting the message, and even getting the image out of, uh, out of the uh, request. So getting the data, uh, that you can do for objectives one and two. But how do we render that data? So user submits their messages, and we want them to see all of those messages in the HTML. So far, we've just been storing one HTML file on our server. Somebody requests our home our root path, we read that file, and we just send that file. We just read the file from disk, read the bytes, and then send the file to the user. Pretty simple, straightforward. You write your HTML once, and that's it. So how are we going to do this when the HTML needs to change every single time a user submits the form? How are we editing? Uh, how are we changing that HTML that's sent? Uh, this is one of those cases where it's up to you, you know, uh, whatever you want to do, if you want to use a different approach than the one I'm about to show, you know, that's fine. Uh, as long as you get the job done. Uh, the way I'm going to show you is HTML templates. And I hope you do use this. I'm going to show a bit more than I usually do. Uh, we're going to go into some code, and I'll show you some more of that code. Uh, we also have some time. There's not too many slides today. I want to show some homework one spoilers as well uh, to make sure everybody's up to speed on if you didn't get homework one, I want to get people up to speed on at least the first three objectives, how you would do those things. Uh, so I'll go into the code again today and show you some templates and give you a better start on how you could write a template engine. But what are HTML templates? 
Uh, instead of writing your HTML in a file, well, you, we'll still do that, and then reading the file and just sending it just directly, instead we're going to write incomplete HTML files or HTML templates. So we're going to write a template that can be used to generate our final HTML. In some ways, it's kind of like writing a class instead of an object. We write a, a class that's going to be used to generate different instances of that class. We're going to write an HTML template to generate various forms of that HTML page. So instead of writing one HTML, we're writing an incomplete file with placeholders of the, where the content should go that we want to be changing, the content that should be dynamic. Homework 2 is all about building a dynamic page. The dynamic content will be replaced, uh, will be uh, just placeholders instead of the actual HTML. And then when a user requests that HTML, we're going to read the template, replace all the placeholders with the actual data that we want to send, and then ship it, and send it to the user. So the, what's replacing those placeholders is going to change as users submit more and more information. That's really the crux of it. So let's see some examples. Uh, here's a very simple example. We have two placeholders. And I kind of recommend the syntax. This comes from a, an HTML template engine called Handlebars. It uh, uses this syntax. Uh, it's pretty effective because the double braces don't really show up in your HTML uh, very often, I guess. Uh, and if you're using this syntax in your template engine, just don't use that, that anywhere in your HTML content. So we're going to use placeholders with this double brace notation. And then use that to say, this is where the title will go. This is where the description will go. And then when we read the file, we're going to replace those which can be as simple as a find and replace. That's what I do in my example that I'll show. Uh, we do a find and replace, replace the placeholders with the actual content that we're looking for, that we're trying to serve. Did, what am I even looking at right now? Toldfish, you, you, did you delete your shrug? I was using that as a placeholder to see what I read and what I didn't. Uh, socket, I don't understand the question. Ajax DOM replacement? Yes, so there is an alternative. I was hoping somebody would ask. Thank you, Nicholas. But uh, uh, when, I'm, when I explain what HTML templates are, I'll take some time and talk about Ajax and um, modifying the DOM. So uh, I'll give a brief, it, um, uh, a brief foreshadow right now. This is the way to handle this problem server side. There's also a client side way to handle this problem of just serving up the raw data and then having your JavaScript on the client side render the data and generate the HTML. Uh, which is what Nicholas is referring to there. And there are pros and cons to both approaches. When we're talking about users, we're referring to any random person accessing the site or users that have ID in our database. Anybody who accesses the site. When I say user, uh, especially at this point before we have auth, I definitely mean just anybody who's sending you an HTTP request. So anybody, it might, uh, might not even be a human. It might be some, someone running a script that's hitting your, your endpoints. Uh, it might be Postman running a sending request. Anything that's sending your server an HTTP request. Uh, that's what I mean by user at this, uh, at this stage. Reminds me of Pug and EJS. Yes, that's what we're talking about. Uh, Pug uh, and handlebars. Uh, uh, I don't want to go down that road. There, there are a lot of options, though. I've gravitated towards handlebars. I, I think most template engines are fairly similar. Uh, I've, I, have a, I have opinions about Pug. I don't really like it. Uh, the tough thing about Pug is I, I don't even want to go down this road because for most of you, it won't really matter. Um, but Pug, it makes it tough to reuse those templates if you ever want to switch templating engines because uh, their syntax is very strange, very different. Can we use these for for loops? Yes, we can. Yeah, or just use Angular, Vue, React, use the front end libraries. Uh, so a lot of solutions to this problem. If you want to use Ajax requests in a front end um, and some front end code, that's going to handle this same problem uh, and host your information as an API. 
If you want to do that, I'm not going to stop you. Uh, but keep in mind, you can't use front end engines. So you couldn't use those ones that were listed right there. Um, Angular, Vue, React, those are not allowed on the homework, just so you know. All right, so then we replace these placeholders. Simple find and replace gets the job done. Place the placeholders with the content that you want to generate. And you can use this one HTML file. Oh, I forgot to mention image file name. Uh, you can use this one HTML file to host infinitely differing data. You could host, do anything with this. This is just the basic structure of a page. You want a title, a description, or an image. You can put, replace those with anything you want, literally anything. When you're doing images, I'll mention this again later as well, but when you're doing images, just put the file name or the file or the path, if you're not using directly file names, on your server to the image. Just put it in the source of an image tag, and that's it. Uh, this trips up a, uh, students from time to time of how are we going to dynamically put images in our served HTML? Well, just put it in an image element, and then the browser is going to make another request for that image. Don't overthink that one. Just put the image tag with the source in your HTML, and that's it. And then your other path is going to handle actually serving the images. The browser is going to make another request. It's going to hit your image path, and then you're going to serve that image as well. There will be multiple requests. Don't worry about how to embed those images into your page, just the HTML. Serve the HTML, browser's going to do the rest, make the other requests. Uh, a lot of students overthink that. Don't overthink it. Toadfish asked about loops. I got gotcha. you. Uh, so we need a, a loop in our, uh, in, our, in our templates for uh, homework two, starting right from objective one. Objectives one and two, we really want a loop because we're going to have an array of data. We're going to have some sequential data structure, um, whatever you're storing them in, of data. And we want to loop over that data and generate HTML for each element. That's really what we want to do. Some uh, users sent us images with captions or images with comments. And we want to, for each of those, uh, those pairs of information, generate some HTML. So, we can do that in a lot of different ways. I like this. Uh, and the syntax here, I really am stealing from handlebars. Um, but building the HTML engine behind that, you can't just throw handlebars at it and call it done. Um, we, we have to build the functionality of how to interpret this syntax. So uh, this is one option you can have. Put two markers that mark the beginning and end of a loop. Very similar to just programming languages where you have open and closed brace. But we don't want to just do open and closed brace. We need something a little more bulky for our notation because we want to make sure it won't be contained in our HTML itself. If we just have a closed brace, maybe somewhere in here we have a closed brace that we want to render onto our page. Uh, that's going to mess up our parsers significantly. If we have this very specific bulky closing tag, we're probably not going to have that in our HTML content. At least we're going to be careful not to. So we mark the beginning and end of a loop. And then everything in between the two tags is going to be our part of our template that's going to be rendered for each element. So we're looping over elements. And for every element, we're going to put the content, whatever that element of the data structure is, in these H6 tags. So if I have five elements in my data structure, I'm going to get five H6 tags with content in the middle. So this is more what we're going to have to do in homework two. Loop over your images and captions and render all those using your custom HTML onto the page. Can we do code within the template placeholder for for loop? You can do whatever you want. As long as you're writing it, uh, you can do whatever you want. A lot of template engines will allow some code in here. You can do a uh, loop for something in, like you can actually put Python code. Uh, if you want to do that, I'm not going to stop you. Uh, but mind you, that is a lot more complexity. You have to start writing, basically writing your own interpreter at that point. So it, it gets complicated fast. Um, so I recommend trying to keep it simple as you can. 
while still getting the job done. You're writing a very, very small subset of HTML template engine functionality. Is PHP an alternative to HTML templates? I think PHP has a template engine built into it, if I'm not mistaken. Like that's basically what a lot of what PHP is. You're writing PHP files instead of HTML files. Uh, so it kind of is an HTML template. I'll say, I'll say yeah, it's an alternative. Any fast comment on the topic WordPress? Not really. WordPress is great if you don't want to learn web development. Is my uh, is my hot take. It has a it has a good place. Uh, I would suspect none of you should be using WordPress because why would you be here to learn all this stuff and then just use WordPress and not use anything that you learned? Um, but WordPress is great for people who don't study computer science. Never knew HTML had loops. Yeah, HTML doesn't. So this isn't strictly HTML anymore. This is not an HTML file. This is an HTML template, which is going to be run through our template engine, which is going to be your code in Python, JavaScript, Go, whatever. And then that code is going to generate an HTML page based on this template. So this is not strictly an HTML file. This is not valid HTML. Oh, shoot, yeah, I, I do have to get the groups out. Uh, so those of you who didn't, so we had the group formation deadline on Friday. Anyone who didn't join a group, I'll put you in random groups. I meant to do that yesterday, and I, I mean, I just forgot. Uh, so I'll do that today. If I don't, please email me if you don't hear from me shortly. Wish you could see more examples in Node.js. I might start doing more examples in Node.js. Uh, so now that homework one's in, I haven't checked yet um, what languages everybody's using, but I'll see how many people are using Node. Like if you're the only one asking for Node, you're probably going to be uh, out of luck on that. But if there are a good handful of students using Node, I'll start showing them. Yeah, one of those. Two. I'll do one of those too, I guess. Uh, we could also do conditionals. This isn't um, isn't something you'll need for homework two, at least. Um, probably not for other homeworks either. But we could also do conditionals, and it's up to you to try to figure out how to resolve this. This is kind of getting into the interpreter thing that I was talking about. You'd have to really parse this to figure out what cookie set is, and then check if that's true or false in your code, and then figure out which content uh, which content to serve. I used to have a first visit cookie in homework two, so this is more relevant. It's a little less relevant um, with the current homework two. Uh, but we can do conditionals too. Whatever notation you want to mark up in your HTML to be able to read from your template engine, it's all up to whatever you can dream up. And again, don't overthink the images. Just put the image name or the image path in the source of an image tag and then let your server in the browser negotiate the rest. Don't overthink that. Uh, some people try to read the bytes of the file and put the bytes in base64 right in the image uh, source. It's fine if you want to do that. It'll work. Uh, but it's more work than you have to do. Uh, just put the, the path in the source of the image tag, and that's it. And you don't have to use the syntax I just showed you. Use whatever syntax you want. But since I'm about to show you code, I'm sure I'm going to see this syntax all over the place, which uh, I'm willing to accept. For this one, I, I don't mind so much. Like last time I showed a bunch of code, I kind of regretted it because I saw that code all over, and I don't know. It was kind of a mess. Today, uh, I'm, I'm fine with it because if I don't show template engine code, Historically speaking, most of you won't use template engines. You'll just have some really hacky code. You'll have a whole bunch of HTML in your server code itself, uh, and it just gets, it, it gets terrible. Um, so I kind of hope people do copy this code that I'll show for the template engine. As strange as that sounds. 
All right, so, so I have this template. Similar to what we saw in, uh, in the slides, but a little different. So I have this template here. Oops, hello elephant. Instead of here's a flamingo and then an image of a flamingo, I'm going to change this to a template and then say here is an image name, some placeholder that's going to be the name of this image. I'm using image name here again. Then I'm going to use image file name here. So I have two variables that I have in my code, two placeholders, one for image name and one for image file name. And that's what's going to be served is whatever I have for these values. So I want to get the, that information into this template. I'm going to go to my nice encapsulated template engine code. And whenever I want to render a template, let me get to my static pass to show you where this is, uh, where this is coming from. So whenever I get a get request for my home page, I'm going to call render template with the name of the template, where to, the file name of that template and then also the information I want to replace in a dictionary. So I'm gonna give this a dictionary. Again, I can't say this enough. This is just the way I have it set up. Uh, feel free to do anything else as long as you can get from, as long as you can get dynamic HTML. I don't really care how you do it, as long as you don't use a, a library that's banned. Uh, but this is the way I have it set up. I have a dictionary with the name for each placeholder and then the values. So I'm saying image name should be eagle, and the image file name is eagle.jpg. When I go to my template engine, I'm gonna render a template. I'm gonna open that file, read all of the bytes. Actually, I think this reads as a string, right? Yeah, read, read it as a string because I didn't do byte mode, right? If I did, if I did this, it would be byte, oops, not there. Yeah, it meant to put it right here. If I did this, it would be bytes. Uh, I didn't do that, so it's gonna read as a string. So I read all the information from the HTML file, the HTML template as a string, and then I'm gonna call my replace placeholders, give it the template, give it the data, and I'm going to iterate over all of my data as long as I had to add this because I had a bug. Uh, I'm gonna check if the value at that key is a string, because if it's not, it's going to be the next thing that we're, we're gonna see, the loop, if it's, uh, if it's a list. Uh, as long as this is a string, go to the template and just replace the placeholder with the data. A simple replace. Uh, uh, you know, some overhead, of course, but at the end, it's just replacing the placeholder with the value, and then when we go to this page, make sure it's running. And when we go to this page, oops, we get our content, it's an, here's an eagle. If I hover, if I hover, do I, do I not get to see the alt text? Oh, anyway. Um, but we get to see our, uh, our rendered template with the placeholders replaced. Uh, so let's go back to our HTML. So that's, that's like half of it. I think that part is pretty straightforward. It's a, it's a find and a replace partial templates. That's the idea of a template, HTML templates and template engines, but not quite what we need for homework two. What we need for homework two is this guy right here. We need a loop. So I'm gonna use that syntax I showed in the slides. I'm gonna have a tag for starting my loop, a tag for ending my loop, and then everything in between is going to be rendered for each element in my data structure. So for that, I'm gonna have two placeholders, username and message. And I'm gonna be careful not to reuse uh, names that I used up here. I'm gonna have username and message, and I'm going to replace those for each element in my data structure with some HTML. I can put whatever HTML I want here 
which for your cases will be an image tag with a source uh, and then uh, putting the name of the image in the, uh, in the template, similar to what we did right here, or exactly what we did right here, but without the alt text you don't need. Um, but I'm going to have this loop. And then I need some code that's going to look for that loop and render it. So when I render this, oops, I'm going to give it in a, a list of objects where each, or dictionaries, where each dictionary has the keys of the placeholder names that I need. I have placeholders for username and message. I have placeholders for username and message. I have to match, I'm matching the data that I have versus the data that I need. Goodness, if I can click the right file. And then I'm going to put this at a key named loop data. I'm just naming it whatever, as long as I'm consistent in my template engine. Uh, and for what it's worth, the code that I'm showing, it's only going to work for one loop. I can only have one loop in my code. It's not the most powerful template engine, um, but it works for one loop. Uh, loop data, I guess I could just do like loop data two and hard code two loops, but with different tags. Um, and then in my template engine, I'm also going to render that loop, which I'm going to do like thus. So this obviously gets a little more involved, uh, but it's all string manipulation. Should be stuff that you're comfortable with, but you might have to think it through just a little bit to make sure you get everything that you need. Uh, I'm going to create variables for my start and end tags because I'm going to use those several times. And I'm going to use find. Find is going to be one of your best friends. It's going to be one of your best methods that you're going to use in a lot of places in this course, especially when parsing those multi-part requests. You want to use find over split in a lot of cases. Uh, we'll see an example of this on Wednesday where split can go terribly wrong, where find is the answer that you're looking for. Uh, when we're looking for that slash r slash n slash r slash n specifically, we want to use find for that don't use split. Uh, so in this case as well, we want to use find, um, where I guess in this specific example, we wouldn't get in trouble using split, but uh, it also wouldn't do what we want it to do. So we're going to find, which is going to give us the index of the first occurrence of this string in the template. So when we get, when we call find, the start index is going to be, this is one big string, we're going to read this file as one big string, which has all the characters um, indexed. It's going to give us the index of this character right here, the index of the first character of the first occurrence of that string. So we have this index. We're also going to find the end tag, which will give us the index of this character. And then we can start doing our string manipulation from there. I want to do take the template starting at the end of the start tag. So I'm going to take the start index plus the length of the tag. This is why I have my tags in variables. I don't want to keep hard coding the tag name each time. One typo, and I'm going to break everything. Uh, so the length of the start tag, goodness, how much, how much student code I see that's like an eight right here. Please stop doing that. Just put your use variables effectively. Uh, please stop doing that. It's because if you count wrong, you're off by one, everything blows up. Uh, just call length. Let the code do the work for you, please, please. Uh, makes for much more robust code. And then if you want to change, if you want to change this, guess what else I had to change? Nothing. I change it there, I change it in my HTML template, and that's it. Uh, but if you hard code this and hard code this, uh, you got a cascading change that you have to make. If you miss one spot, uh, you're screwed. You got bugs in uh, questions. So I'm going to take a substring. I'm going to take from the end of the start tag to the beginning of the end tag. That's going to give me everything in between the tags. That's the, the juicy bits. That's the stuff I need to render for each element in this data structure. It's going to give me basically a template, which is just the body of the loop. I'm going to get my loop data out of my data. 
Remember, this contains all my placeholders from the previous example and all the loop data. All of it's in one big dictionary, uh, for the, the way I'm doing this. You could just have that separate parameters, and then you wouldn't have to worry about checking if this is a string, because we don't want to try to do a find and replace on the array, uh, is why I had to do that. If you just want those as separate parameters, it might be easier doing it that way, to be honest, now that I think about it. So, bless you. So get the, the loop data and the loop template. Once we have both of these, we're ready to render the loop content. I'm going to start it as empty string, use our accumulator pattern from way back in 115. I'm going to start with nothing, iterate over all of my data. And since my code is nice and encapsulated and modularized and all those good words that we like, I'm going to call replace placeholders, same code I used up here. I'm going to give it the loop template, the loop data, or sorry, the, a single piece of content. I didn't know what to name that, so I just got more, uh, just got two verbose. I'm going to replace every placeholder in this template with the data that I have here and add that to my loop content. So this is the actual loop that's looping through that part of the template and replacing the HTML with my information. And then to get my final content, I have to get this loop content right in the middle of that HTML template. So I'm going to splice my template, go from the beginning of the template to the start of the starting tag, splice in my loop content, and then grab everything after the end tag of the loop uh, at the end. I think there's a better way to do this, but it's, I couldn't think of it. So I just did it this way, uh, which is pretty clean. Now, uh, and at that point, at that point, I have all my content rendered exactly the way I want. If I want to change this, I'll say I want to change the way that renders. Uh, I don't even know what I want to change. I don't know. Put this in italics. I don't. I don't know. If I want to change this, I just change it there, and boom, all that's changed. So I just change my template, and then my template engine that renders that template, given the content. It's going to take it from there. Now, notice a few things. I have the structure. The HTML, remember, is only concerned with the structure of our code. It's not concerned with the style. It's not concerned with the functionality. Uh, we've seen that by separating HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But now we're going one step further. We're also separating the structure from the actual data that's being rendered. Your HTML file is just concerned with structure. How do we structure messages? but there's no message information contained here. All of our data is separate from our HTML. HTML just says, this is how you structure data, but we're taking all of the actual data out of it and saying HTML has one job and one job only. How do you structure the information? That's it. Separation of concerns, we love it. The template engine is concerned with the data. So the template engine got the data got the template, and says, how do we mash these things together and actually add the data to our HTML? But notice what's not in here, which may or may not be in many of your homework solutions. I hope to see not since I'm showing all this code. But notice what's not in here is any HTML at all. There's no HTML in here. There's no HTML. Oops, I keep clicking on the wrong one. There's no HTML in here. It's strictly data, username and message for each person. Image name, image file name, no HTML, zero. There should be zero HTML in your template engine. There should be zero data in your HTML template. Uh, this is the way we like things set up. Separate the style, separate the functionality, separate the structure, and separate the data. All four of those things should be in separate camps, and you focus on one thing at a time. It helps us keep organized. It helps us be able to expand our code. If I want to change this, I want to add another message here. So I want to add if I want to add this, I don't have to think about how that's going to be rendered on the page. 
I'm not thinking about HTML at all. I just add that message and it adds to my page. That's what we want. I'm focusing on strictly data there. If I go to my HTML, when I change that to italics, I said, I want all messages to be italicized. I didn't have to think about the data at all. Uh, and really italicizing, like things like that, I should be doing in CSS. So I'm violating that a little bit, even uh, just the way I'm showing it here. Um, but we want to separate those concerns as much as we can. Any questions on any of that? Everyone feeling good about template engines? Uh, and at this point, you can do all of objectives one and two. This is the last piece of the puzzle that you needed to really fully complete objectives one and two on homework two. I have nothing else that I say is going to help you, uh, except buffers, I guess, on objective two. Uh, nothing else I say is going to help you on objectives one and two. You, you have what you need for those. Um, with that one exception of maybe buffers, depending on your browser and server, uh, how they communicate, uh, you might need buffers for objective two. And once we do talk about buffers, you'll be good for objectives two and three uh, after Wednesday. No questions? It took a jump in complexity? Maybe. I don't know. I think, yeah, maybe. I can, I can see where you're coming from there. Uh, in the slides, we, you know, that's all conceptual. It's usually, so I'm trying to show more code in this class. I mean, I, I, I overstepped a little bit the last time. I've mentioned that a few times. But, uh, but the concepts are usually not too crazy in this class. It's usually not too bad to follow the slides when I'm saying, like, here's an HTML template. You know, this is the idea. But when it gets to coding things, it gets a bit trickier, uh, especially the last lecture, parsing the multi-part form requests. Like, in the slides, it's like, okay, here's what your request is going to look like. It's not that complicated. Just follow along and see what's going on. It's when you go to write your code to parse those requests that gets pretty intense. There's always, in this course especially, I guess with a lot of courses, there is going to be that jump in complexity from the concept to the code. Uh, it, it gets a bit more crazy. So I can see how, how you see that. <laughs> yeah, if you don't have questions, I have a question for you. That's right. I, I, try to do that every time. I'll make sure, because if I didn't cover well enough the content for you to answer the question, I want to make sure I give you a chance to ask questions first if there's any confusion. Everyone good on this? Anyone need more time? Well, I got more stuff to talk about, too. I'm trying to not, because I keep jamming the lecture question in at the last second. I'm trying to not do that. So I'm trying to do these before I get to the end of my content. But of course, when I don't do them right at the end, y'all get restless. So I don't know. I might go back to right at the end. And the answer is 42. Autolab won't let you submit 42. Are you sure? We, we, yeah, we know about editing HTML on the front end now. <laughs> if you get it wrong and you email me and be like, but I submitted 42 and I check, I'll give you the point for that, <laughs> for this course. Yeah. Anyone need more time? Everyone got this, right? Okay. All right, let's crack open a few more of these files. Uh, still a few more of these files. So requests, I couldn't show you until today because it's homework one solutions. But I want to show you a little bit about how to handle requests and just the way that I approached it in my code. Uh, so I like to create a request class, which is going to have various fields that have all the parsed information that I'm looking for. 
So when I create a new request, which as its constructor parameter is going to take the bytes of the request. I'm always going to work in bytes. I'm never going to work in strings because I don't know if this request contains something like an image where I can't parse it as a string. So I'm always going to work in bytes. I'm going to I have constants for my boundaries as byte strings, this b and then a string. That's going to give me an array of bytes, a byte array of that content, of those bytes. And then I'm going to write three separate methods. I like modularity. We like modularity in computer science, uh, in programming, I guess, software engineering. I'm going to create three separate, uh, three separate uh, uh, methods. Split request is going to chop this request into the request line, the headers, and the body. The body I'm not going to do anything with in this code because I don't know what the body is. I don't know if it's the empty string if this is a get request. I don't know if it's a multi-part form request that contains an image, multi-part form request that does not contain an image. It might be a JSON string. I don't know what it is. Uh, we've had all those cases in your homework. You have to handle all those different cases. I don't know what this is going to be. So in this file, I'm not going to handle that body at all. That's going to be for a multi-part form uh, handler somewhere down the road. It's going to handle that or something else if it's not multi-part form. So I'm just going to store this in a state variable, and that's it, or, uh, uh, a field. I try to call them fields in, after 116, state variables in 116. Um, then I'm going to parse the request line into method path in HTTP version. That's just splitting on spaces. Nothing much to do there. I'm just decoding. At this case, at this point, I know that this is valid ASCII, so I'm going to decode it using UTF-8. And split on strings, easy. Uh, return that and then put them into three more state variables. I, I did it again. It doesn't matter. Uh, field, state variables, instance variables, uh, whatever you want to call them. And then another method to parse all the headers. I'm going to get those headers that I parsed up here, which uh, oh, I didn't talk about split requests. So split requests, I'm splitting into these three values, the request line, the headers, and the body then parsing the request line, then parsing the headers as three separate, three separate methods. So to split the request, I'm looking for a new line character using find. Find is our best friend here. This is where it is actually critical uh, that we use find. If we do split, for example, split on new line right away, that's going to cause magnitudes of trouble. That's big, big trouble. Uh, because what if somewhere in the body of your request, you have a new line character? Well, you just chop the body of your request in half. That's no good. Splitting right away, bad idea, bad idea. Only look for what you're actually looking for. In this case, to find the request line, I'm just looking for the first slash r slash n, the first new line character, and that's it. I'm going to look for the first new line character and then split based on that. Everything before the first new line character, that's my request line. Then I'm going to look for that blank line, that slash r slash n slash r slash n. I'm going to look for that blank line. Everything before that blank line, but after the request line, that first new line, well, that's going to be my headers. And then everything after is going to be the body. So string manipulation, look for those characters, and then take everything in between those characters before and after uh, as the values I'm looking for. But more importantly, first new line character, first instance of a blank line, what that blank line appears in my image, which we'll actually see on Wednesday. Uh, I'll show you how, uh, how split can go terribly, terribly wrong. Find is going to give you the index of the first character, the first instance of that value. So you can find the first instance where that occurs. Give me the first new line that separates my request line. Give me the first blank line that separates my headers from the body. Uh, request line, nothing to talk about. We already talked about it. The headers, uh, I'm going to iterate through these, split on uh, semicolons. This is where I can use split, by the way. I know my headers have a strict format where each new line separates a new header. I already have the body out of the way. I already have the request line out of the way. 
Now when it's just the headers, I can safely split on my new lines. So I'm going to split on my new lines. I can safely decode. I know it's ASCII. I can make a lot of assumptions now. Uh, those assumptions will be true because according to the spec, these headers that I've isolated have to follow a certain structure. So I'm treating it as a string. I'm splitting on new lines. I'm going to split each line on semicolon. I'm going to strip out the optional white space. Remember, headers can contain a space after the colon. I, I've never seen them without the space, but according to the spec, that space is optional. Uh, either way, we're going to remove all the white space and then add all our headers to a dictionary. So I have a dictionary of all my headers. If I need to look up the content length, I just go request.headers of content length, and I get the content length. You've seen this elsewhere throughout my code. I'll just do like request.path, request.headers, request.body, and just get that information. It's because I threw all that information in fields of the request class, created an object of that class based on my request, and then throughout my code, I just do request.request.request. Dot, request dot, request dot. And I'm not thinking about how to parse these things ever again. I write this code once on homework one, and I never have to think about how to parse headers or how to separate the, uh, the headers from the body of a request. Never, ever, ever again. I write not even that much code, 31 lines of code, and I just save myself tons of time throughout the whole semester. Strongly recommend that you do something like this. Um, and since I'm showing you the code, I'll probably see this exact code. Uh, and then notice also, if you will, that uh, nothing in this code talks to the TCP socket. Nothing right here talks to the TCP socket. When I'm actually using the TCP socket, there's almost nothing in here. Like handle is where I'm actually talking to the TCP socket. Everything is just deferred to other stuff. I'm calling my constructor, getting my request, calling my router to handle that request. Very, very little code actually touches the TCP socket. That means when I'm in this request file, guess what I get to do? Testing, I didn't set up formal unit tests, sorry, but uh, testing without having to run the server. Huge time save. If you can test, I'm testing all of this parsing code. I can parse this request, which I just got from, you know, I made a request and then um, co copy and pasted it into my main method. Not the most formal testing, but I can run this and get, oops, I have it set up to run in the debugger. I can run this in the debugger. Uh, I, I forgot I messed it. Well, I came this far, I have to. I have to add another, another line here, else I have to click through everything. And then I can check out my request and make sure that everything was parsed the way I want it to be parsed. There's all my headers. My body is empty string. This is a git request. My method is git, HTTP version, path. Everything's the way I expect it to be. I can test without running my server just by calling this code. Uh, so if nothing touches the TCP socket, the only thing I have to actually run my server to test is this line of code and this line of code. And that's it. Like, I don't have to do anything else. Of course, I would add my buffer, and I'd have to test the buffer by running the thing. Uh, but I don't have to run this thing for very much. And then uh, I don't really have time to talk through it, but I recommend having generic code for your responses as well, though there's not as much going on there. Uh, with that, have a great day. See everyone Wednesday.